way I describe it is my husband went off to Afghanistan and I don't know who the heck came back in his place, but it's not him. She was very, very angry and very upset and I, and I can remember feeling like my heart was broken because she said to me, don't expect the old Jeanette. Forget her, she's gone. You know, I knew something was wrong with him and he knew something was wrong, but if he couldn't figure it out, he would, he would get livid, just livid. It was like a flash of light with these like flaming pumpkins, dead quiet, silent, and that's what knocked me out. You don't know where's it coming from, so it doesn't really matter where's it coming from. You're just in there hoping that you make it to the, to the next station. It hit our vehicle, and it, it literally, you feel the shockwave pass right through your, your, your body. And uh, it, it was so tremendous that it, it actually forced the liquid right out of your bladder. It's been estimated that traumatic brain injury affects nearly one in five service members and veterans who have served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Many service members and veterans also report having symptoms related to post-traumatic stress disorder. These symptoms often overlap and can occur at the same time. Each person who is injured is different, and the way individuals recover is difficult to accurately predict. Some individuals are able to resume their lives as if nothing happened. Others may have difficulties that last longer, even a lifetime. Research points to a significant relationship between the way a family copes with and adapts to the injury of their loved one and the success of their loved one's rehabilitation and recovery. In the minutes ahead, three veterans who sustained a traumatic brain injury and their families will share their stories of love and support amidst the struggle to regain their lives. Amadeo and Carol live in a small, rural community. In the past, they were both very active in their community and enjoyed going to the opera. That all changed one morning when Amadeo's unit was bombarded by mortar shells. The next morning, um, I felt terrible, like my meat had been ripped right off my bones. Um, I went to the medics and they pretty much said, no blood, no injury, go back to work. And the first symptoms I noticed was that um, I couldn't judge my work, where to set down this particular item. Um, I'd overpass it, I'd hit people with it, which is dangerous, you can crush and kill them. Crane operators, you know, they can set it on a dime precisely. And if you can't do that, you can't operate a crane. Like many men and women who sustained a traumatic brain injury while serving in the military, Mado knew that something was terribly wrong. However, he wasn't quite able to pinpoint the problem. It wasn't until he came home on leave that his wife Carol noticed the severity of the symptoms. He was very anxious, very fidgety, almost so anxious, anxiety ridden, I would say it was verging on panic. Looking around, hyper vigilant, um, Anything that was out of sorts or anyone coming in the driveway or a noise going by, he was jumping because a noise over there meant something bad. They're in the desert, it's sheer quiet all the time unless something bad is going on. And so I, I didn't know who this, this guy was because he was anxious and along with his anxiety came some anger and frustration. He didn't know what was wrong and I didn't know what was wrong. I just knew it was wrong. Mado came home in April. I met him up at Fort Drum. And we'd been exchanging letters and emails. I knew what was going on a little bit from what he was telling me. And he came home that one day and said, hi, honey, I'm home. And I said, not for long, you aren't. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do, but I had to send him back up. He got hurt in combat. And the Army owed him some proper care. They at least owed him an acknowledgement that he was hurt in combat. And I knew that it had to start with them. Over the next several months, 
Carol began filling out paperwork and advocating on Mado's behalf while he received treatment at Fort Drum. When I first got out, I left Fort Drum. Um, I wanted to go back to work. You know, I wanted to take up my old life, get back to where I was. So um, about a week or two after coming home, I went down and talked to my old boss and the HR people, and I told them that um, I wanted to come back to work. So I went back to work, and I tried to work with people like I did before. Um, they were wary of me. I was um, wary of them. <laughs> it was a very tough situation. I, I found myself more and more working all alone uh, down at the shop where I could smash up old furniture and get rid of it, take out my frustrations. Um, eventually, I had a few um, incidences with vehicles to where I would um, watch myself drive off the road and run over a mailbox and then watch myself come back onto the road and then completely, uh, it didn't mean anything to me. Mado described these episodes as gray outs. As they became more frequent, Carol reached out to the Syracuse VA Hospital for answers. The way we first discovered that it had to be a brain injury, um, I had suspicions. I could see him stopping and not being able to find a word. I could see him doing something he would normally do and stop because he didn't know what to do next. It was, there seemed to be some blanks. And the one thing the Army did is they sent him to a neuropsychologist at Syracuse VA Hospital. And she did some testing. And she says, you kind of like, I got good news and I got bad news, Mado and Carol. The good news is Mado's a very intelligent man. The bad news is he has some very slow processing going on. And the testing showed that. So we knew right from the beginning that there was a TBI. When I looked at those x-rays, and the doctor says, see these white spots? That's your broken things. It was like, okay, now I know. This is what's broken. It can't be fixed, but at least I, I, I'm, it's a relief to know that there's something there. That, that you're not crazy, that you're not, um, you know, uh, making this up because that goes through your mind, you know? Am I crazy? Am I making this up? Is, what's going on? It doesn't make it easier, but when you have a name for it and someone says, yes, you have a brain injury, this is what it is. We can't fix it, but let's learn how to cope with it. It's a big relief. For Mado and Carol, learning to cope has meant sacrificing many of the things they'd shared before. In spite of this, they try each and every day to build on the strengths of their changed relationship while nurturing the goodness that is still there. There's a real lack of intimacy that we used to have in our marriage, the hugging and kissing and just a normal sex life is gone because I have to say, I'm going to hug you now so he can brace himself, so I can touch him without him backing away and me feeling shunned. I've had to learn that. I've had to learn that he now has a personal boundary around him that I can't breach unless I ask. It's affected us in, in ways that I never expected. Um, our world has shrunk till there's Mado and me. And sometimes we're not on the same page. Um, we used to socialize a lot with our neighbors and now we don't. And when we go visit our kids, he's aloof. He finds it very hard to get involved in their lives. Everything seems frivolous to him now. It makes life together very hard. It's, it's on a day-to-day -day basis. During her tour in Iraq, Sergeant Jeanette Arroyo spent countless hours behind the wheel of gun trucks. Driving transport vehicles on a series of missions deep into combat zones meant exposure to IEDs and other explosive devices. You know, you're moving around because the trucks move, you're constantly moving. And the thing is that it's at night most of your mission. So you really can't see nothing, you know. We have to, we have to depend on our vision. And the noise first is supposed to scare you, right? But 
After a while, you already know what it is, so it doesn't really matter. Jeanette was always very friendly, outgoing, always respectful, uh, bright, easygoing. She went to Iraq. Uh, we made it a point to re email her every day. Um, started seeing some changes in, in the behavior um, where she was no longer um, as outgoing in her correspondence. Um, she did not share whatever she was experiencing over there other than to say that it wasn't a bowl of cherries. And like I noticed that I, I had like nightmares, you know, and, and I feel like lost a lot of times. I started noticing my neck hurting a lot, like a shooting pain on my left side. And as time went by, like I couldn't, I really couldn't move my neck. So I went and saw the doctor and uh, they just gave me some Celebrex for the pain and then get a day off, you know, not to go on missions. And uh, I continued to, to go on missions with the pain and uh, it got, I should not have done that because it got worse. It got to the point where I couldn't even carry my weapon any longer. After undergoing extensive surgery to repair her neck, Jeanette returned to New York and her adopted Aunt Carmen with no idea she was experiencing symptoms associated with a traumatic brain injury. And then she came home. And when she came home, she was different. Um, she was angry. She was angry all the time. Um, she had no patience. Um, she had a constant blink. And uh, I remember that uh, she couldn't focus. You couldn't have dialogue with her. She became easily agitated. Um, it was very, very difficult. It was scary. She aggravated me a lot because she started telling me things such as, um, you know, why you blink your eyes so much or why you breathe so hard or, uh, or why I, I speak the way that I spoke, uh, why I get angry. That type of uh, comments, you know, that, uh, she always said like, oh, you're so hyper, calm down, calm down. I did get a call one day where she was extremely angry, almost enraged. And I asked her what was the problem. And evidently someone had cut her off. And um, she, she was really angry. She wanted to run them over. She wanted to chase after them. Um, she wanted to hit them with her car, you know, and this was indeed the, the behavior that I, we were starting to see. Coming back home, driving, uh, especially in New York, like, uh, it's crowded, you know, and I remember dr driving and driving in the middle of the road, you know, <laughs> and uh, I felt comfortable when I was in the middle of the road in uh, potholes make me very uh, nervous, you know, people crossing some time in front of you, you know. So my, my reaction was aggressive, you know, it's like with vehicles, you know, they cross. <laughs> I, to me it was fun, you know, but that I knew in group, I learned that it was not good, that I was being, I was being aggressive and I should not be driving the way that I drove before here.